Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, uh, everyone, wherever you are tuning in from. Uh, my name is Jean Philbert Tengimana. I'll be the host of uh, this conversation. I'll start by asking my uh, fellow panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, we have four, uh, we have three panelists today uh, joining me. Uh, we have uh, uh, Mr. Dr. David Senge, uh, Minister of uh, uh, Education uh, in uh, Sierra Leone. Uh, we have Julie Owono, we have Eva So Albion. They will introduce themselves. And I know I didn't pronounce the title correctly, Mr. Minister, so forgive me for that. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to ask uh, Julie Owono to first please introduce yourself, tell us where you are tuning in from, um, and then I'll go to uh, Eva, uh, David, and then myself. So I was thanking um, IFA policy teams for and partners for putting up this uh, important conversation and timely conversation. And uh, thank you to our dear host, uh, Jean Fulbert, for uh, making sure this conversation goes smoothly, which I'm sure. Um, I am Julie Owono, the uh, executive director of Internet Sans Frontières or Internet Without Borders, which is an organization focusing on digital rights or human rights in the digital space and era, as you prefer. Um, and uh, we work on, of course, protect, making sure that our human rights are protected and enforced online the same way they are offline. And we also uh, working for connectivity for all uh, in order to make sure that everybody on earth and specifically uh, in our dear continent has access to, to knowledge, has access to information and to the global conversation. And I'm really happy to be here today. And I'm tuning in from, from Cambridge in the Boston area where I'm currently doing um, research uh, fellowship at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. Thanks for having me. Great, thanks Julie. Uh, Eva? Um, so hi everybody that is uh, looking from the audience. Uh, thank you so much. I'm very happy, very honored to be sharing this uh, panel with you. Um, I am Eva, uh, I'm based in Dakar. I'm a part of the IFO policy uh, since uh, three years. Um, so I'll take the opportunity to uh, give some words about the Innovation for Policy Foundation, uh, which drive the IFO policy movement. Uh, we are a movement of hubs um, that connecting ourselves, unifying our voice to work with our governments on public policy reforms for entrepreneurship and innovation, um, mainly uh, around three pillars. So the one is the continental uh, approach um, around the, 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 the manifesto that you have might heard uh, lately those years. Uh, the second pillar is the national uh, process reform. So we have been engaging with uh, more than 50, uh, 15 governments on the continent to have better policies um, to foster innovation. And the third one is tools. So we're building open source tools for communities to engage their startups, to engage with other uh, communities and be able to do public consultation. So I've been involved in uh, uh, the entrepreneurship ecosystem for the last, last nine years. And I'm very happy to join you on this conversation about the role of youth um, in the, the response of COVID. Thank you. Great. Uh, uh, Mr. Minister, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is David Moina Senge. I'm the Minister for Basic and Senior Secondary Education um, of Sierra Leone and the Chief Innovation Officer. And um, I suppose I, on this panel, I'll, I'll speak both as in my capacity as minister, but most uh, primarily as one, as one of the leaders um, in the ICT response for the government. Um, I sit on the presidential task force um, on COVID and th that's where we figure out policy um, informed by data and then develop technologies and solutions um, to inform our response. 
And this is, then I end up um, leading a team of people across the Ministry of Information, Ministry of Health, private sector, the Directorate of Science, Technology and Innovation that I lead, um, and private citizens who are looking to uh, develop solutions, who are developing solutions to support our response. Most of those people are young anyway. Thank you, I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Minister. Since, uh, let, let me start with you uh, then uh, with the first question, which is um, the topic today is the role of youth in COVID-19 response and recovery. How do you see young people getting involved? Let's first talk about the response today before we go to the, uh, to the recovery. So uh, what are the young people in Sierra Leone doing? What do you hear? What do you see young people uh, in Africa doing? And perhaps also a reflection of what they should be doing more or less? Look, I think um, it's, it's a great question. And it's easy to, and I was listening to the video that was played, all the media and the doomsday, narrative about what will happen in Africa and how we'll be dying and um, was a, an imagination um, of people's perspectives, you know, maybe their fears and their worries um, that was driven by um, us being held in a, in a different light and being judged by a metric that perhaps um, does not reflect who we are. And you can't do this as a, as a continent, but you certainly can't generalize um, across countries. There are certain things that are true. Countries like Sierra Leone has, we have weak uh, health infrastructure. We know that. We, we know that our fundamental health systems are weak. Um, but it's also true that countries like Sierra Leone have experiences that the U.S. doesn't have in fighting diseases. It's also true that partners in health and Paul Pharma, who is helping with surveillance in, in, um, in Massachusetts, in USA, where one of our panelists is from, learned that in Sierra Leone and learned that in, in, in West Africa and that surveillance methods and contact tracing um, and identifying contact it's something that we are good at. It's something that we, 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 they are bringing from here to there. It's also true that we do have robust testing ability, not necessarily the capacity, but we have researchers and scientists and we can do PCR tests well with, with low variance and where the validity of those tests can be held scientifically anywhere. And to... The, the topics that we're talking about, we also have young people who've been creative and who've been innovating all these years and who are looking and who are absolutely entrepreneurial. And so in terms of what the, I mean, I, I hate doing stuff to prove other people wrong um, because it's not a motivation, but it's almost like the role of young people is to prove everybody else wrong uh, about Africa. <laughs> Um, through what we do, and that the, the doomsday narrative need not be true, and it cannot be true. And it's our responsibility as leaders and young people to make sure that our story and the outcome is different, that at the end of this, that the world we awake to um, must have African and, and, and young Africans being thought about differently as problem solvers that we've always been, and as, um, as, as people who, are, who can be entrepreneurial when given the right set of resources. So back to Sierra Leone, right? We have lots of startups, um, lockdowns. Everybody talks about lockdowns and when you should have them, how you should have them. They're effective some places, not effective other places. It's hit or miss, it's political decisions. Um, some of the things that we did was when we used data, we collaborated with researchers in Sierra Leone um, and MIT to be able to get data um, from citizens and, if, and bring that upwards to, to policy decision making. We combined those data, we call data record analysis with food um, security analysis at the chiefdom level. We combine that with, with, with surveys, we combine that with security data, we combine that with mobility data and several other data to make decisions about how Sierra Leone's lockdown was. And we ended up going with a three day um, lockdown twice now. And we have a partial um, inter-district lockdown so people can't move. But to facilitate that, uh, people have to get passes. Essential goods still have to travel. And the pass system 
the first time we did was paper based. And paper based passes um, require that people have to come somewhere to pick up paper. And it's very much then you can share um, potentially, uh, it's a risk to bring all those people together. So we, in collaboration with some private sector people, we built an e-pass um, and the e-pass is both um, online and can be validated with USD. Everybody uses USD around here and it's easy to use. And so we worked with the telcos to, 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 to develop um, the, the USSD channels. And that was two startups, independent startups, working with DSDI, Directorate of Science, Technology and Innovation, and Ministry of Information and Communication and Ministry of Health to deliver something for the emergency um, operation center or emergency response. So that level of collaboration across government and across sector and across startups and is, is something that is happening that we see um, regularly. And there are many examples of this, by the way, that we are doing, not just in Sierra Leone, but um, I'm sure other people can talk about um, across the continent. But it, it really is that it is happening. Uh, and what we need to do more of is that open collaboration, that ability to share, that ability to use what we already are good at. And that is youthful inventiveness, creativity, um, focus on mobile technologies, which is predominant where we um, around these parts of the world, um, and use it as a platform to see digitization, really. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there for now. Uh, yeah, Th thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. Minister. I think I will get back to you on some of the things you said and i can't agree with you more on things like the role of youth in africa is to prove everybody wrong it is true that at the beginning of this pandemic there were doomsday scenarios you know showing um africa being the the, the worst hit continent of course uh, we can't claim victory now because this is the marathon this is not a sprint so far so good for Africa, but we need to sit tight and co continue on the same uh, path that allowed the continent to uh, sort of contain. But yeah, I, I completely agree with you that the narrative about a continent that is fragile, that is lost, that is uh, not able to stand up to the, the, this kind of challenges, that is not able to find solutions within itself uh, that narrative is shifting, is changing. And if there is one trend that I can see, which we need to encourage and sustain into the future, that change of narrative, I think it's, uh, it, it's one that I completely agree with you. So let's, let me go to um, Julie. Tell us, Julie, what do you see young people doing and what they should do more and what they should do less? Wow. <laughs> So um, thanks so much, uh, Mr. Honorable Minister. Your your introduction was so um, comfort comforting uh, because uh, it was a great reminder that we have resources and we have solutions in ourselves, provided that we look into them and that we trust them, that we trust ourselves, and. Um, this coronavirus is also an opportunity for that, for the African continent and its populations to trust themselves instead of always looking for solutions coming from elsewhere. So um, I, um, I would say, of course, that the continent is the youngest um, in the world. So obviously, I mean, it was almost as an obligation we had to we had to be active we had to to be doing a lot of things which we had been doing anyway before even before the crisis and we have seen in the past how how creative our youth can be in turning challenging challenges sorry into opportunities and that's really the case uh with the, with this crisis from from these young developers in senegal working on a on a very cheap testing um, uh, kit for for COVID COVID nineteen to um, um, 
being innovative and reaching out to communities and pass information to them on platforms that they use and particularly through uh, the use of um, WhatsApp, for instance, everybody uses WhatsApp or you know messaging apps. Uh, we have seen how um, creative some governments have been to reach out to communities on these platforms, but they were so because they trusted, they decided to trust um, the intelligence of, uh, of, of young people. Um, so I think one of the lesson is indeed, we should trust our youth more. Uh, that is really something that I hope we will take out from this crisis. How as a continent, we should um, bet on the, the, the capacities of our, of our young people and not only rely on them uh, at the last resort, but really include them in, uh, even in the decision-making, even in the, in the policy-making, listening to their voices, looking at what, at what they are doing, being inspired and, uh, and, working, and working with them. Um, I think it's also one of the other um, interesting lessons that we can take out from it um, would be, we cannot, I mean, it's 21st century and it, it will be impossible as we go further into the century. We cannot, it's impossible to put aside the need, the, the emergency to switch to digital societies. And to do that, we need uh, the raw material, which is connectivity. And if we are to trust uh, youth and youth creativity uh, and to trust our ability to, to, to step into that, to that era, digital era, we must double down on efforts to make sure that everybody on the continent, even in the most remote area possible, is connected to the bandwidth. And unfortunately, that's although there has been a lot of progress, and that's great. Uh, but when we're, I mean, there's still a, a lot of people, uh, and especially young people, who have access but need to need to sacrifice so much to be able to have that access. And uh, yes, if we are to have a sustainable digital society that is just for all. Uh, equitable for all and profitable to all. I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a work that we need to that our governments and also civil society organizations such as ours, but also citizens need to double down on. Um, I think that's yeah, that's something that we we are pushing. We have a campaign uh, coming on that with several several organizations uh, to yes ask governments and also private sector companies and also citizens uh, how we can work together to solve this issue once and for all, this issue of connectivity, making sure everybody's connected at the right price and with the right quality of the network too. Absolutely, thank you, Julie, for, for, for those uh, thoughts. Again, I got a feeling that everything that you say is a topic on its own that we can, you know, discuss and debate for hours and days and write a, a lot about. Um, I retain um, your point about, you know, having confidence in our young people and not just as a resource of the last resort, but a true partner that uh, can, should be engaged, not, not just during the crisis and emergencies, but in everyday. Uh, policy making, execution, uh, and, and efforts uh, towards uh, the continent's development and transformation. So I, I agree with you uh, on that a lot. Um, the other thing is connecting everyone. Um, again, one of my positions, I, I will introduce myself in a moment, but I also uh, will serve as the chairperson of the Alliance for Affordable Internet. So. I, uh, like you and others, um, understand how this pandemic, if there is one thing that it accelerated, is the move towards digital. And your call for everyone, not just government, everyone, private sector, you know, academia, to sort of join hands and solve this problem, make sure that we've connected everyone to broadband. I, I, I'm, I'm happy to pursue this conversation even on one-on-one -on -one basis and see how we can really join forces. 
I believe we can provide concrete solutions, not just campaign. I think in this area would be preaching to the converted. I cannot go to Minister Senge and start preaching this. I want to go to him with a solution and say, hey, let's do this. What I want from you is just say yes. And for us, we are going to do this. You know, uh, but great, great point, uh, uh, Julie. Let me go to Eva. She spent nine years engaging young people around topics of innovation, entrepreneurship, basically being problem solvers. What do you see and what do you miss? Thank you so much for the question and, and uh, for your previous in uh, intervention. There is this, uh, this strong quote that I love with saying that young people have the power to shape the process and the outcome. So they need to be a part of the process and, and not just uh, targeting the results. Um, we have been doing this uh, amazing survey to hubs and, uh, and entrepreneurs and what we learned from that survey is like 98% of the startup has solution to share or to provide for the response to the COVID. So the, the young people on the continent are showing a lot of resilience. The entrepreneurs themselves are showing actually a lot of uh, resilience, trying to explore um, and at the same time to learn and to give back also. And I think that, um, Coming to what uh, Honorable uh, Dr. Senge was mentioning, there is a lot of solutions that have been shared around the continent which can tackle social development, see how they can help um, sharing the right uh, information to their communities in local language, for example, using WhatsApp, but also using other uh, supports such as a podcast. Um, we have seen a lot of uh, young company that are I vote uh, to be uh, developing a local mask with uh, uh, local uh, raw materials in wax. For example, we have seen other that have started um, developing solution, um, solution here. Um, we have our young developers uh, in the university um, working with the startups in uh, how they can help those um, uh, those communities in rural city or in other part of the country, which has an access to water to have uh, some solution to be able to wash the, the, the hands. And I think that we are in a, a moment where all the, the young people are showing regarding the crisis a way to, to be a uh, citizen engagement and how they can uh, build networks to help others. So in Senegal, for instance, we have a lot of uh, a youth network that collecting goods actually for family that don't have the, the, the possibility to uh, uh, quarantine themselves. And um, so, yes, th there is a lot, a lot of uh, amazing solution. Uh, maybe one that I, uh, one that I really like uh, and uh, can bring here as an example is a solution that has been put um, between the startups and the government. Um, so we have all these uh, social distancing measure um, to stop the spread of the virus. And we see those new public private partnership with innovative companies to just deliver bread uh, to, uh, to families at home. So people don't have to, to, uh, to uh, stuck at the, at the pastry. Um, and I will finish with uh, one, one topic, which I think it's one of the, the, the most important is education. Um, Actually, our youth and children cannot go to school. The schools are closed. And uh, we have seen a lot of e-learning solution emerging uh, on internet. Uh, we have seen a lot of uh, a new content uh, creators uh, on uh, education topic that are uh, um, broadcast on uh, local TVs in local language. And uh, we have seen a lot of podcasts uh, as well in local language to be shared. To, to those young children so um, they can uh, still have this literacy. Thank you, Eva. Um, again, uh, localization, you know, youth being part of uh, creating local, locally relevant solutions. And, you know, um, I, I've seen how Asia developed, you know, there is no point trying to reinvent the wheel. If there are something that is working in a certain place, of course, we respect people's intellectual property, but why do you waste time um, 
uh, uh, coming up with something that is already figured out, if you can just localize it, put in a local language, making it relevant for your own community and your own people. This is something that young people can do. Um, it, I, I take a few courses at MIT. Uh, by the way, I'm, I'm based in Cambridge, and uh, Dr. Senge is a very is a star there. Whenever I say I come from Africa, they, they think Africa is one country, and everybody knows Dr. Senge. So it's it's great finally to be able to meet him. But one of the things that I discovered there when I went is there is no shame about talking about something called venture cloning as a way, as, as, as a tactic or strategy for entrepreneurship. Just look at a, a great venture that is doing wonders in China and Silicon Valley, in Israel, in, in, in Kenya, or in, in, uh, in Lagos, and you are in Johannesburg. Look at them and create something similar. If you can, the market will be the ultimate judge whether your idea was good or bad. If it's bad, it won't cut. Uh, I'm not saying, go and copy and steal, but I'm saying, I mean, something that is already in the open, if there is a good strategy to respond to COVID in Korea or in Japan or in China, why wouldn't we look at it and see how it can be made relevant to our own context? So I completely agree with uh, your point on localization and also the role of young people in meeting basic needs. You need the basics. You need people to get bread to every doorstep. You need logistics to continue to operate even during the lockdown. Uh, and, and who is in a better position to do that? In a, in a continent, a country as well, we don't have these huge established distribution networks. Those are our young people. One of my favorite companies, in fact, during this lockdown in Kigali was a company called Ameza. Ameza means table. So what they are doing is something unprecedented there. They, they have an app and the logistics and supply chain to do food sourcing, you know, cr crowdsourcing for food. You know, you may have one extra kg of beans or rice. Um, just give them a call. They will come and pick it and make sure it gets into the hands of those who need it the most. So definitely young people are showing that uh, the, 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 the world and the continent need them now. And then your point on education. I think it's a great point. We can get back to it later. Education is being transformed. Everything is being transformed. Who's gonna deliver the education of the digital era that we are going into? So thank you so much for this first round of uh, introduction and points. Uh, we have started receiving questions, but let me also introduce myself for a bit and, and give my, my sort of take on this question. Um, so uh, over the last sort of 10 years or so, I've served in the public sector. I serve as uh, Minister of Youth. Uh, Mr. Senge, I feel what you feel right now. Minister of Youth and Information Technology in the government of Rwanda for six years, between 2011 and 2017. Um, and then I proceeded to spend some time at Smart Africa, which is this Pan-African uh, public and private partnership uh, platform that um, is led by the president of Rwanda, President Kagame, to really bring the leaders and the industry together to see how the continent can move together in uh, attracting opportunities of the digital transformation and accelerating digital transformation. In fact, the, the objective of connecting everyone and everything, actually, is part of uh, their uh, mission or the aspirations of, uh, of Smart Africa. And prior to that, I had spent some time in the private sector uh, leading uh, the first company that brought mobile health solutions in Rwanda back you know, 15 years ago. Um, and um, today uh, I'm sitting in Cambridge. I'm, I'm finishing a, a fellowship at the Harvard Kennedy School uh, where I focus on the role of digital entrepreneurship. And during this COVID season, I also joined hands with a couple of friends and uh, we created uh, the Commons project. In fact, they created it and I joined it as a trustee uh, and also uh, helped coordinate and advise on the Africa, on the Africa um, 
operations. So this is what I've, I've been doing. And again, very, very honored to be part of this uh, conversation. So my tech, um, I think everything that I, I, I thought I would talk about in terms of the role of youth during this time um, has been touched upon. I wanted to touch on you know, being problem solvers. That is understood. I want to, uh, to touch on the fact that so native, they can figure out how to leverage digital technologies to solve the problems of the present, but also projecting into the future. I think that uh, has been uh, addressed. So I, I, I guess um, the, 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 the other, the most important also point here is youth being at the forefront of changing the narrative about Africa. Um, so for, for those who have had an opportunity to sort of travel and interact, Africa is, is understood in, in a very wrong way. You know, when people are dying in Africa, we see that on TV. But when they are dying in Italy or Spain, we don't see that. I can bet with everything that I own that if coronavirus had started in Africa and made the kind of disaster impact that it made in other parts of the world, you would see dead bodies on TV. We are not seeing that because it's not happening in Africa. So I think changing the narrative of Africa trusting our own ability to confront big problems, looking inward for solutions. I think this is something that the, it's one of the trends that the coronavirus would have accelerated and is one trend that I wish and pray, and I'm, I'm happy to work very hard uh, with others to sustain beyond this, um, this pandemic. Right, so that was my take. So let me go to the first question. Again, I asked the question to the all the panelists, and it's a question that came from the audience. How can we as young generation engage with the government so that they can help us develop our startups and therefore add to the economy? So uh, I'll start with Julie. What's your take on this question, Julie? So I will try to be very um how do you how do you call this politically correct since we have a representative of, of government in the on the panel um but be be practically correct as well politically as well as practically yeah yeah no i think um how to have government listen that listen more um you know in my in my work um I have seen that we can achieve change by engaging more with uh, authorities too. Um, we, I mean, citizens in general, um, we have a tendency of you know, expecting a lot from governments, but I think the political time can be, is much slower than the innovation time. And uh, therefore, well, you, sh I think should, organize and you know engage with authorities in a in a you know in a very of course respectful way but you know with you know showing concretely what we're doing and to see what we're changing um i mean in my work i've done that with many governments and that has produced quite a lot of results you know i thought you know usually in civil society organizations we tend to be um, very critical. It's very important to criticize, but it's also important to uh, bring in um, solutions and um, respectfully, of course, again, uh, and engage with our governments, even when we don't agree with what we're doing, especially when we don't agree with what they're doing. Uh, they're also keen on listening. And I think this era which the COVID has brought to us has, has also taught us to be, to be humble even when you're a government, you don't have answers to everything. And uh, it's, it's, it's an honor when you can recognize it um, and also uh, you know, call for collaboration with, with others. So it's definitely a time for youth uh, and young people in general to engage with their governments uh, and show 
what they're capable of and bringing in solutions. That's what I would say. Great. Um, Eva, what's your take? Um, so thank you. I think um, at first, we all know how our governments uh, on the continent are uh, prioritizing uh, digitalization. The startups for the most innovative one are using uh, the digital um, to leverage on different sectors. Uh, we, we discussed education earlier, but that can be agriculture and uh, uh, health indeed. I think uh, I will answer in three points. The first will be for the startups itself to start. You need to be able to start and to show that the solution that you want to partner with the government for uh, will bring impact. So talk to the final users, uh, came with some research that can prove the impact. Um, the second point will be that the fact that we need to, to unify our voices. Um, if I am in an ecosystem where I'll have a different startup getting to the government, each of them to provide uh, their own solution, that can be hard for the government to be able to answer to all of them. And we have seen that into the, the national processes that we, we run. When we get together, we have more strengths uh, and the government needs to listen to us. So get together with the other startups to address a specific request and be able to prove that this request is a need for the final community that, that will be using it. And the, the last, uh, the last uh, point, it's more about leadership. I think that we have been waiting for a long time for government to come and, and meet the youth. I think that things are changing. Uh, the medias and the digital is offering platforms for young people to express themselves. And um, I think more than ever, uh, youth uh, initiative and young leaders have the power to build uh, such network um, so that they can be here from the government, so that they can collaborate, initiate those new partnerships that I was mentioning earlier to, to work with the government. So it's a matter of structure, structuring uh, the civil society, structuring the ecosystem, uh, a matter of uh, unifying all together uh, as a group, and then a matter of impact. Be sure that people need uh, the solution that you, you will want to, to work with the government for. Good. Um, I, I've, I've refrained from paraphrasing what you say because I tend to sort of concur with uh, everything, whether it's Julie talking about the speed you know, of, of policy and the politics being slower than innovation and therefore uh, having government sort of leverage the speed that the young people bring on board to sort of accelerate the pace. I think the way this question was asked from the audience was not really in antagonistic terms, uh, like what the youth need to tell the government um, uh, or whether government is not hearing or responding. It's more like what mechanisms can we put in place for that collaboration, which is really happening today more than it has ever happened before. Uh, so recognizing that now we have this chance that this is happening, how can we sort of put a structure, as you say, how can we put a structure around it and sort of turn it into a new, a new normal? This collaboration between young people, entrepreneurs, innovators, and governments, how can it be sort of crystallized and something that I can call um, a, a silver lining on the COVID-19 cloud. But Minister, give us your last word on this question of how should young people, how are they engaging with you? I think now yeah. let's leave the hypothetical NGO type of talk and go to the actual reality. You know, um, I was talking to, I was just mentioning to my friends that maybe I should just hang out with you guys all the time because maybe it's an echo chamber in the sense that it, it, I think it's, it's what you were saying. People 
have been waiting for too long. We're waiting for government to come and organize, for government to put all the things in place for young people to come and innovate and to come. Yes, we cannot overstate the importance of government. As um, um, in Rwanda, we see that evidently. In, in Ghana, in Sierra Leone, with the emergence of the national innovation and digital strategy, we see that. In Senegal, we see that. In Tunisia, we see that. Government's role is important. But however, the, the most critical element there is the, um, is, the, is the amount of solutions that are ready, right, to be funded, to be, to be moved along. So it's, it's about citizens, and this is also an entrepreneurial opportunity, right? So this is not like, oh, it should be free. And as you said, it shouldn't be some NGO doing it. There's an entrepreneurial opportunity there to allow for people to take a set of companies, a set of ideas, a set of prototypes along a track that ultimately becomes profit-making. And we see this, like I said, all the time and uh, in Sierra Leone. And within this period, I'm working with a set of young people who constantly are reaching out to be like, hey, David, I, want, I have this idea. Hey, David, I have this education platform idea. Hey, David, here's this mobile idea. And I say, great, show me, demo it. And when you demo it and we can move it, we'll move it forward. It's that, and, and it, it comes back to your point about how we tell our stories and who tells our stories for us. We don't tell enough of the stories of the young startups, of the young people who have a good idea, who make it up. We tell too much of the stories about those ones, about the weak ecosystem. We know the ecosystems are weak. Like it's not news. We know, we know that the institutions are weak. We know that there is corruption. We know those things. We don't approve mm. it. We don't think it's okay. But yes, and yes, it is weak. Yes, people, government needs to create platforms. Yes, government needs to create money. But yeah, we've seen that it works. We've seen that um, there's money available. Yes, and what? And I think it's, and I'm happy that you rephrased your own question. Uh, it's that, because uh, that's important. It's also in how and what kinds of questions we ask ourselves and ask of our people. And you said something which I wrote um, again to, to my friends, which was that, um you, you're not coming to me to tell me about the problems you're coming to me with a solution because i don't need to be convinced why are you coming to convince me that what oh you know mr minister it's great to have e-learning platforms for our children um what should i say thank you for that great idea you know nobody's thought about it before like that's so ingenious thank you it's i want to see I want you to come to say, here's this platform, here's how we've tested it, here's how I use it for, with my children, here's how I use it in my community, how do we move it forward? Um, and mm -hmm. there are people who can uh, observe that it's much easier to move uh, prototypes forward. And this is, and I think, again, this is the responsibility of civil society, who've allowed civil society to shape itself to be generally, and there are different societies, to just be the, oh, we're just whistleblowing, oh, we're just sitting to observe, oh, we're just calling foul play, as opposed to be the engine of creativity, as opposed to be the engine of support for young people and ideas, as opposed to be Mr. the Minister, person that says... Uh, sorry to interrupt for, for your, your very uh, passionate... Uh, I, I will get back to you in a minute, because our friend Julie is begging for the permission to leave. And I don't want to release her before she says something on um, the question that was asked about, uh, it's good for young innovators to find solutions during this crisis. Mm -hmm. One mechanism should be put in place so that they respect legal frameworks and things like privacy, a privacy protection. So Julie, before you leave, give us your take there and wish you well uh, for the rest of the day. Thank you, uh, Phil. I'm so sorry. I have to, uh, another another call this morning, but uh, yes. Uh, well, to respect privacy, I think uh, first of all there need there needs to be a legal framework, which many of our countries still lack with regards to privacy protection, which is so essential, especially as we're moving to a digital society, as I was saying. So it basically rests on the shoulders and responsibility and ethics of individual entrepreneurs to take that into account when they're innovating, uh, make sure that their innovation is not infringing other people's uh, rights and not infringing uh, the, the, well, 
the the, ne the importance of respecting uh, people's privacy uh, in general. Uh, but just rapidly before we before I leave, unfortunately, I want to I wanted to thank uh, again the organizers uh, and just say that yes, yeah, civil society is important and it's also very important not to repress it. And that's also something that we have to work on, which is another lesson from the for the COVID-19. And uh, yes, because solutions, of course, we do have solutions. I give I can give multiple examples when I went to governments to work with them and uh, propose solutions. But it depends also on what are they. Yeah. What is the consideration given to that civil society? And I think that's really a lesson that many governments can take, not only in Africa, by the way, that's the case in many other places of the world, including uh, in France, where I, I work a lot too. So yes, I think it's, uh, again, that the lesson from the COVID is humility. We need each other. We, we, we can count on each other, uh, provided that we respect each other. That's what I wanted to say. And I wanted to thank also the audience for the great questions and um, attention today. Thank you, Zuli. We need each other. We need to have each other's back. Thank you for very much for joining us and good luck with the Internet Without Borders effort and looking forward to reconnect offline. And Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I think the minister has also extended an invitation. So please take a note and have a good day. I will. Thank you. Bye bye. Minister, I'm sorry to have interrupted you when you were. No, 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 that was, that was great. Very... That was, uh, I think it's important. But I mean, I think ultimately, um, and I'll, I'll end, I think my, my point was made, um, which is that it's not enough to just sit and wait. Uh, it's all of our responsibilities. Governments have critical roles, and we understand that. And our citizens and our civil society our jobs could also and should also, and the more of that needs to happen, be to say, hey, here's this solution that we built. Here's a solution that somebody built. Here's how you use it. Here's how it's been tested. Hey, here's this evaluation that happened. Um, that's all. Absolutely. So, in fact, you know, this approach of saying, you know, how does the government engage with young people is around solutions. There is I, that's during my experience, my time in government, that, that's the, 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 the sort of my takeaway. Um, one example is uh, a program that was initiated during uh, the time I was in government called the Youth Connect. You know, uh, I think it's a program that now has spanned from Rwanda to more than 10 countries in Africa. And I remember how it all started. It all started with uh, having a cup of coffee with young, you know, I used to go hang around in coffee shops. So one guy found me and say, hey, I've got an idea. Uh, what about a program called Youth Connect that can allow um, the young people to contribute solutions to problems, you know, leveraging new technology to sort of crowdsource ideas and solutions. I mean, the long story short, the program Youth Connect was created in Rwanda. Uh, it, it grew very quickly into sort of a solution um, workshop. Uh, we started a Youth Connect Award to recognize best of those solutions on yearly basis in every district of the country. And today it has become a Pan-African program. So completely agree with you that perhaps the structure that needs to be adopted is such kind of structure. And in fact, Youth Connect exists. It has so many partners, the UN, has joined to promote the sustainable development goals and engage young people through that. So it's something, in fact, I would invite people to look at as a model or a structure to sort of bring youth innovativeness and ideas and creativity uh, on board as we continue solving problems, which will evolve. Today, we are talking about COVID-19. Tomorrow is going to be about how do we create recovery, jobs, economic growth. After, after tomorrow, it's gonna be, how do we you know, talk about education transformation? Because it, won't ha it, it has to be different from the type of education that we have today. So as all those questions come up there on the questions board, there should be an answer board. And really the time of the policymakers be spent time listening and encouraging and then uh, investing in young people, which is really what is happening during this COVID. And I uh, hope that 
it will continue. Um, so let me jump on the next question from the audience. It's a long one, but I will read it uh, the way it is. Uh, I hope, Minister, we are still together. Are we together? Eva, are we together? Yes, we are. Actually, maybe I take the, the, the opportunity to quickly, before we, we get to the next question, um, contribute a little bit on this part participatory approach that you were mentioning, giving the Youth Connect example, which I find right. really fantastic. Um, I was talking a earlier about uh, this, um, the, the startups and the entrepreneurs and the ecosystem getting together and uh, uh, taking the, the opportunity to share a little bit about a, a concrete example of what we've done here in Senegal with the, the IFO policy and with the ecosystem. So mm -hmm. has the startups and has all these hubs uh, that are bringing support to the startups uh, were evolving, we were seeing that uh, the, the startup were facing a lot of challenges. The challenge, of course, that we'll, we'll see in Senegal for them to engage, for example, with the government as he was asked during the question, or for them to be able to uh, uh, raise funds or um, to, to be able just to grow and scale their activities. Uh, it's complicated, and that one of the, that reason was the legal frame that was not appropriate for those uh, profile of uh, companies and profile of startups. And um, we have decided to bring uh, the the ecosystem together, so the, those hubs, the startup themselves, and to start with organizing uh, a policy hackathon. So we had called it the Dakar Policy Hackathon where we have been doing two things. The first was a challenge mapping to define and prioritize an agenda. And the second one uh, was uh, the solution. So to have the startups, the ecosystem themselves being solution providers um, and uh, to draft the way they will see policy in a much efficient way for them to be able to scale their business and their activities. So from then we came up with a draft that was a draft of the law that was submitted to our government and allow our government to see what was the priorities and what the ecosystem was awaiting for. And we get into this co-creation with the government to uh, work on this uh, law reform um, to be sure that all the institutional parts that needed to change or to bring new reforms was a part of it. And uh, we make sure to consult at a more national and high level way, uh, the entrepreneurs themselves, the uh, entrepreneurship communities, the civil society to hear from them, to have their feedbacks and to integrate all of those feedbacks into uh, the draft law. Um, what we have seen is that uh, the government was listening. The government was ready to work with us. Um, the government was also really interested in this kind of, um, as I was saying, participatory approach, bottom-up approach, where the communities themselves share what they need and where the policymakers integrate them. So I wanted to share about this process. This is a process that we have been replicating in a couple of countries uh, uh, around the continent, but also uh, the, the, region, the region here in Sub-Sahara. And we seeing that whichever country we go, uh, the government open his arms and listen to us to build with us the reforms that will help those young entrepreneurs to uh, shape companies, innovative solution uh, to change the people's lives. And uh, in Senegal, for instance, the, the text uh, was pushed by, by some uh, national champions, so it also uh, important for the start startups themselves and the ecosystem to be able to target the ones that are going to listen and with them to evangelize the other ones. And uh, I, I need to, to, to say that the startup was vote here in Senegal uh, on December 27. And uh, we, we hopefully going to see the other country taking this as a priority to be sure that they can help and they put the right reforms for the startups to be able to grow. Good. Um, 
So um, I don't know whether um, Dr. David Senge is still with us. I am um, here. Oh, very good. So um, I, I will take one of the questions that is coming here. In fact, I've, I've jumped the long question. I, I'll go to the, to the short question because I think it connects what uh, Eva just said about reforms in Senegal. The question is about resources. I think it could be easy to do reform because um, I mean, I'm not saying it's easy uh, as such because there are many places where reforms are still needed. Uh, but anything that doesn't require a lot of financial resources, I would say we have the means, many countries have the means to do just reforms. Uh, but what about resources? So Neha is asking uh, here that she's done uh, a digital health and one digital agri business apps but she's struggling to find the financing and she's sort of putting the blame on government. Minister, what is your sense about this question? I mean, so there, so there are facts, okay? And one of those facts is many African governments don't have money loosely available. And we, for all what it's worth, we still depend and rely on World Bank IMF loans and grants, we still take loans. So it's just a fact. There's a fact that institutionally, historically, um, the context is that there's not money. And yet, there are still countries who use those and, and who make it available through research at universities, through investments at various levels to support research and innovation. And in Sierra Leone, we set up the Directorate of Science, Technology, and Innovation, and, and we work with startups, various startups, to, to deliver and deploy um, their solutions. One of our primary um, thing, one of the primary things that we do is to focus on ecosystem strengthening to so the ecosystem. And that requires figuring out resources, mapping the ecosystem, mapping out where the money is, and making those available, uh, even if we are not the ones to, to provide it. And so, it's, it varies across countries, um, and the key is, and I do agree with the, the person who's asking that it depends on the, on the, on the, it depends on the, the, the government. And the key is to look and find who your likely ally for resources might be. It may not be the minister of information and communication, nor might it be the minister of education. If there is money and resources available in minister of in ministry of agriculture, sorry, ministry of health or ministry of agriculture and you can create some link between agriculture and health, which there are, then go to where the money is and develop the solution and deploy it. So we also have to be clever about resources and that resources includes money and capacity and context and just um, luck, to be honest, also there's luck. And this is also true with the startup world, whether you're in America or um, UK or wherever, luck does come in with startups, so. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with you. Um, you know, governments uh, in, in Africa don't have the kind of resources that can allow to do some of the policies we've seen, which is like blanket financial um, coverage, you know, uh, that I see in some other parts, uh, like uh, here uh, in the US where you see governments uh, basically printing money and giving to enterprises to stay afloat uh, during this COVID. Um, I mean, no other country, very few countries can use that kind of fiscal policy uh, to stimulate the economy. If, if you try to do that in, a, in another country with a currency that is not as strong, then you, 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 your economy is likely to get more harm than uh, recovery uh, by exercising this kind of tool. But on the other side, uh, Minister talks about ecosystems. I think there is also, we need to sort of give the right communication to, to, to the young people. Government is not sort of an answer box for everything. So the ecosystem, one of the things I actually learned recently at MIT is sort of develop the language around how do you describe ecosystem and there are five key actors and um, entrepreneurs are absolutely the central piece, but you have the risk capital, universities, government and corporate. I sometimes get a feeling, you know, even during my time in government, that government is um, the expectations 
on what government needs to do to advance an ecosystem are sort of uh, like taking over what other actors are doing. You know, universities are responsible for raising skills level, education, uh, making the environment of doing business do well, enforcing the rule of law, doing all the reforms, uh, then uh, create the demand, you know, be the customer of the app. So I guess Neha would like the Minister of Agriculture to take the uh, digital app, you know, digital agribusiness app and, and use it or promote it. So government to be the demand side and to be also the supply side. So because the side of risk capital is not yet developed enough in many places, uh, we could have funds here and there. They address different segments, but the whole continuum from early stage, you know, from idea, the, you know, like the angel network um, doesn't, you know, the, the, the angel investment level doesn't, is not strong, doesn't exist in many places. So you, you, you find people struggling because in um, rich countries, the first level you go to when you have such an idea or a prototype is friends and family to raise 10,000, 15,000, up to 100,000K just from friends and family. In Africa, government is the friend. Government is the family. And, and I don't think that is, um, uh, is scalable. I think what is scalable is, to your point, Minister, is to sort of accelerate the growth and maturity of the ecosystem so that the risk capital you know, takes on a life on its, itself and is able to meet the demand of the whole continuum. So that is the point number one. Point number two is also for the entrepreneurs to be a little more, more proactive. You know, entrepreneurship is, as I come to learn by trying to become one uh, myself, is, is tough. So I would say to, uh, to the young innovators who've got solution, I would return the question and ask, how many pitching competitions have you attended? How many have you won? Because it's not enough that you are an African innovator that your solution is good automatically or qualifies for support automatically. You need to make your proof. So during this COVID, I have found that there are, there are websites that sort of catalog the opportunities and I think i for policy has done that work as well to sort of identify what are the sources of financing available to innovators who are innovating around COVID-19, whether it is in the healthcare sector or even the other sectors because they are part of the recovery. And being able to point to young people those resources and uh, so that they understand you, you, you don't have only the government to rely on. There is the whole civil society that Julie was talking about. There are so many international national, regional competition. And next time I, I'd like to hear a question which says, hey, here is my app. I've gone into this one, two, three competitions. I've won those competitions. I've proven that the, the, the solution is really needed and meets the market demand, but I'm still not able to find, you know, seed investment. This is where I used to tell young people that if, if you prove that, I take the risk as a burden on myself. I, I, I want to even myself invest in that. I hope you are, you, you are not looking for a million dollars, but if you are looking for 5K, 7K, 10K, hey, I've got a friend, I can give a phone call and see that you get the 10K you need to get started. But I want some other people, not me, to prove that your idea is good. And the way you prove it is going through this kind of demonstration, competition, prototype and so on, and really be able to say, I have, I have demonstrated the product market fit. I need to grow. And at that point, I can promise you, funding will be looking for you. You won't be looking for funding. Even here in Africa, funding will be looking for you because there are so many, uh, so much money that has gone uh, on, on wrong solution and still chasing the right solution, the right idea. People want to be rich by investing into African startups. So bring, bring on that idea. Um, I think we still have some 20 minutes. 
to get uh, going. There is a question about young people taking responsibility when it comes to their health. So the question says, what should we as young people, and I think this is a question that the young people are asking to themselves, but uh, I'm happy to have uh, a panel that is also young. So that question comes to you, uh, my dear panelists. What should we as youth do to change people's attitude towards health and safety, seeing them as paramount? Uh, given that there has been reports and um, cases of diseases and outbreaks which are really related to people being nonchalant. Okay, that's the question. And let me start with uh, you, Eva. Are you nonchalant about your health and safety? Am I not sorry? It cuts a little. Am I not challenged? No, are you nonchalant? Like, Oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not at all. Uh, I've put myself, so in Senegal, for instance, we are not in quarantine, but since the, the children are not going to uh, school no more, I put all the family in quarantine. So I'm not non-challenged. I think that it's important because it's a way, it's also a way to protect the others. It's not about just us. It's also right. the other one that you're meeting and who you you putting uh, in in security space? Um, so I think the first the the first uh, thing, of course, I'm thinking about all the communities that don't have the ability to put themselves in quarantine. We who evaluate in the daily basis, it's hard for those people to be able just to stay home, uh, uh, not going to work because uh, they they facing challenge just for it. And mm. but for those uh, like us, which are changeful to be able to 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 work remotely, we need to stay home. We need also to be able to involve ourselves in uh, getting the information to to in our local language. Um, in Senegal, we speak French. Uh, most of the people understand Wolof, which is like the the local language here. But the community that are at risk doesn't speak well of. So it's important that we help them to have the right information in those uh, others uh, language that are, are not known. I think also that those that uh, are chanceful need to provide goods. Um, if I have the chance to go to the grocery and be able to, to buy food for a month, that means that I have the capacity to offer food to a family or to help this family in its sense. So more than ever, this solidarity approach needs to come from those that have uh, at minimum um, a secure money to be helping the other communities that, uh, that are not allowed to. Um, I, I wanted also uh, to, to come on this, on this question of uh, non-challenge to, to see mm -hmm. that there is a, a, a lot of community that don't just have access to the right information. So when they have somebody that telling them uh, that you need to, uh, to eat garlic, they believe in that. So we have the responsibility of the information that are uh, running to be sure that we that are connected don't push the, the, the bad information. When we just see on WhatsApp, we receive a lot of information. Those of those information are not verified. So I need to take my own responsibility to check on an information before spreading it to other 20 people, because that's mm. how I can mm. protect also the others. Um, and I will, uh, I, I will um, uh, finish on that point by, by the fact that we are in communities uh, where we share a lot with the others. And when you go to more urban culture environment, we see that the way that we need to communicate to the people are quite different from uh, the space where you are. So it's important that we just explore whole way of uh, uh, securizing the, the others, sharing the, um, the information as well. Um, during the Don't Go Viral campaign, we have seen a lot of graphic artists that was doing graffitis uh, around the cities to be sharing. So at least everybody needs to involve his own uh, person 
at this level, uh, I mean, through his family, at this, um, uh, I mean, environment, so be able to help the others to provide some goods and uh, more at national level, just checking about the information that you're going to post on social media, that you're going to share with your, your uh, professional partners or others. I, I wanted also, if you uh, allow me, maybe just to uh, step back a little bit on a point. We are in the closing mode. Um, I've been informed that we have four minutes to go. Uh, okay. So if you want to take a little bit more time, make it your parting shot. You know, and give us three keywords. You know, I've taken media literacy as something that you, you just talked about and checking information before you spread as a big responsibility for young people. Uh, if that's one, I, I take note. Give us two more shots, and then uh, I'll go to uh, Dr. Senge for his parting shot as well. And then we'll hand over back the control to I for, uh, I for policy to sort of uh, wrap up because this is the final session of the Pan-African Digital Assembly. Completely, completely. I think that the subject is just too passionate. So three things. The first is um, the, the call maybe to work with the youth. Um, so from the government, and even if, as Dr. Senge was mentioning, the government doesn't have money, they have the ability to give money in another way. So tax reduce, for example, tax reform. The second will be most particip participatory. So partner with youth, have this um, bottom-up approach, consult them to be working with them. And the third one will, will be support to youth leader. So support the youth initiative to have them at the decision-making level. <laughs> excellent, excellent, excellent. Thank you, Eva. It's been a great pleasure being with you again. This conversation continues. It uh, doesn't end here. Um, I retain money, resources, partnership, leadership. Uh, those are very great, you know, parting shots. And uh, Mr. Minister, the floor is yours. What is your parting shot? What do you want? What are the top three things that you want young people to take from here and go and change the world? I think young people are already changing the world. And I think we, some, it was not mine actually. It's, I think it was Julie who said, we should trust young people more. If there's anything, young people should trust themselves more. Other young people should trust other young people. Government should trust young people. Um, and that's one. A second thing is we need to, to do more. We have spoken a lot. We know the history, we know the theory, we know the information, we know the problems. We've, we have diagnosed the problems well, and those problems need to keep evolving, it need to um, keep changing. And there are solutions that people are doing, but I invite civil society to be part of generally the problem solution and bringing and elevating other um, institutions that are developing solutions and bringing it to government. And that will allow, I think, a better relationship between government and civil society. Um, where you hold us accountable and we should be held accountable and you also bring us solutions and um, hold us accountable for the solutions that are brought. Um, it's too unidirectional, uh, the blame game and the challenges. And the final point is that the, the current world will change and it's on Africa and African youth to define how we want to emerge out of this whether as another statistic or whether as the ones who are doing the analysis to inform the world about where the world is going. We can be the leaders, we can emerge a strong um, economy, a strong platform for the, the new world that will, uh, that will um, emerge and it's up to us. So the challenge is uh, let's write the future, uh, how we want it to be told by our children. Thank you. Excellent, Mr. Minister. Again, it was a great pleasure uh, sharing this panel with you. I take trust uh, as, as, uh, as, as central, trust our young people, have confidence in them and uh, partner with them uh, to create solutions and uh, shape, shape the future. Um, the, the, the other one, you know, let's do more. You know, I heard you saying, let's walk the talk. And especially when it comes to 
inviting civil society to join governments and communities to create solutions. And finally, I had loud and clear accountability. Let's hold each other accountable. Um, uh, government, citizen, institutions, private sector, corporations, let's work together and hold each other accountable. I think those are really, really great parting shots to the point that I have not, nothing left to say other than to say thank you so much for sharing your insights and inspiration with uh, the youth of the continent. Thank you very much for remaining engaged into this conversation. Thank you very much for the leadership you are taking where you are uh, to shape, to respond to COVID-19 and shape the new world that uh, we are um, entering in. And thank you for being really at the forefront of defining a new generation where Africa is not running to catch up with the world, but where hopefully Africa goes to the, front, to the forefront and leads in some of these critical aspects, including the use of new technology. Um, I will hand over the control back to uh, IC policy for final remarks as we get to the end of the Pan-African Digital Assembly. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Jean Filbert. Thank you, Honorable Dr. Sange. Uh, it is a honor for me uh, to have the closing remarks. These have been three incredible days with our community partners. And I want to thank all the audience that have been following us on uh, Facebook and on other platforms. Um, I want to thank all the entrepreneurs that have been part of the Continental Entrepreneurship Forum. I want to thank the, the partners that have believed in uh, uh, this Pan-African Digital Assembly, UNESCO, uh, with the amazing work that we did through the Don't Go Viral campaign, GIZ, Facebook, uh, Enabel, um, IFD, and uh, all the, the amazing uh, IFO policy team that have been working night and day since uh, last month. So thank you. The conversation, as you were saying, doesn't stop here. As you know, we had three days of co-creation on one of our tool, Auxilio. So I invite people to join us and keep the conversation online through Auxilio on the digital assembly that Africa website, but also on our website, ifopolicy.org. Um, and let's co-create the future together. So thank you all of you. And uh, we can't wait to be sharing the outcome of those uh, three days of co-creation. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Mr. Bye Minister, bye. I'll be in touch. Yeah, <laughs> bye. <laughs>